Well, I'm, I'm Jonathan Sharp. I'm one of the jQuery team members, um, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to uh, meet with you all today and, and share kind of uh, what we have going on and uh, some areas where you can improve your projects. A little history about me here. Uh, let me slide forward. Um, uh, I've been a professional web developer uh, since the, the late 90s, uh, back in 1997, when the web was quite a different place. Um, it's been extremely exciting over the, the past 13 years to see the way that things have moved forward and progressed, and the way that tools like jQuery have come and really filled a niche and made life easier um, in a really more exciting environment to develop apps in. Uh, I've used jQuery in primarily in the enterprise and large projects since March of 2006. And for bragging rights, um, jQuery did not have a version number at that time. It was still based on the SBN revision. Um, it had been out for about four months at that time. Uh, and I had the opportunity to use it in a project and have used it ever since in a variety of them, uh, par particularly in a large scale setting. Um, I also, like I mentioned previously, I'm on the jQuery team and my role in, in title there is primarily infrastructure team lead. So I manage all of the, the jQuery.com um, properties. And so if the site goes down, um, I'm usually the one logging in to fix it. So that's been an exciting project. Um, the jQuery properties all together get close to 25 million page views a month. So it, uh, it, <laughs> there's some challenges sometimes. Um, Professionally, I am now the president of Appentu, which does consulting training and support for jQuery and jQuery UI. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, to join with Mike Hostetler, another jQuery team member, and take what we were doing um, privately in kind of a freelance and small business consulting role and turn it into kind of a full-time focus. And so we've had a, a great time uh, officially forming this past November. And since then, uh, we've had a lot of very interesting projects and clients and have been hiring, um, so if you're an excellent jQuery developer, we'd love to talk to you. Um, so that's, that's what I do in my day job right now. And I currently live in Omaha, Nebraska. We've been chatting before, and I, I've lived kind of all over the country. I uh, was born in Boston and have lived in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area and in Southern California in the Orange County, Laguna Hills area, um, as well as Chicago. So I've been in Omaha about four years. Really love it. It makes flying great. I can get to either coast um, with about the, the same level of effort. So um, the one downside is I, I don't ever get any direct flights usually. So you take what you can get. So we'll jump in here to the, the five jQuery mistakes or really improvements that you can make in your project. And uh, here's kind of an outline of how it goes. So the first is selective performance. And there's a lot of material on the web today about how to tune selectors and, and that type of thing. Um, but we'll look at a few examples there. The next is each itis, as I'm, as I'm calling it. And that really has to deal with the concept of implicit and explicit iteration, which you may be doing one or the other and not really even knowing it. And following that, we'll, we'll dig into some event binding and look at, at the different types um, of approaches that you can take in binding events. And this is an area where uh, typically a lot of projects that we step into um, can benefit from, from some different patterns that have emerged and that jQuery provides. So we'll look at that. Uh, following that, we'll, we'll dig into handling AJAX errors and uh, specifically one type of AJAX error that, that commonly is not caught or, or dealt with. And finally, we'll, uh, from the infrastructure side, we'll talk about sourcing jQuery from CDNs and specifically jQuery CDN um, as well as some others such as Google and Microsoft and that type of thing and some of the, the benefits and pitfalls and just what you need to be aware of when you start pulling that into um, your projects. So before we do that, though, I want to kind of step back because there are some core jQuery concepts that are really important that um, are, are kind of hidden as you first start to get in and start using jQuery. It's, jQuery has a very flexible, elegant API that makes it wonderful to uh, get a return on a little bit of code very quickly. And so it's easy to be a, a proficient jQuery developer. Um, a lot of developers that I talked to have been developing for, say, six months to a year, and they love it. Um, but there's a lot of things going on under the hood with jQuery 
that they don't necessarily understand. And so before we, we get into the five areas where, where we can uh, make some improvements, we're just going to look at some core concepts um, and make sure that we have that, those fundamentals down first so we can really effectively apply uh, what we're going to learn here. So in the core concepts, there's particularly five um, that pop out. And the first one is the DOM. And that doesn't even necessarily apply specifically to jQuery. That's just really a general web developer um, uh, concept that you really need to understand. But a lot of times people have heard of the DOM, they've worked with it, but they really don't understand what's going on. So we'll, we'll take a quick look at that. We'll also dig into uh, selectors and how those apply with jQuery. And following that, we'll look at collections. Um, and collections are one of those topics that as you start moving from a beginner to an intermediate and start understanding that and, and how that works and how that's beneficial, um, that really increases your productivity. And following that, we'll, we'll start to look at chaining. And chaining really is most beneficial when you are using it with collections and selectors efficiently. And finally, implicit versus explicit iteration. So jQuery takes a lot of the um, iterative type patterns that we were familiar with with just pure DOM scripting and wraps those up and abstracts them for us. Um, but there are some ways where we can look at improving performance there. So the first concept is the DOM. And um, for a number of people, this will, will be review. But there's just kind of a, a graphical representation here that we need to understand. And on the left is, is pure HTML um, text. And when the browser takes that, it parses it into a DOM. And the DOM is what we work with primarily as web developers. And one of the things that was frustrating prior to jQuery was the massive API uh, in working with the DOM. And jQuery came in and took that one particular pain point and wrapped an API around it that was very elegant and also built a pro, uh, upon the CSS selectors, uh, which was a pattern that we were already familiar with with jQuery or um, excuse me, with CSS. And so this is, this is really important that you understand this. Um, and we'll, we'll move forward here, but we'll see this play throughout the presentation here. So the next concept is DOM events. And this is coupled with the DOM. But the basic uh, thing that you need to take away and understand from these slides, I'll walk forward here, is how events propagate up the DOM. And so if we look here, this first list item, a click was triggered on it. And any event handlers are handled on that particular list item. And then it's passed up to its parent node. So in this case, the unordered list onto the body, and finally the document. And this feature and behavior that events um, is what enables event delegation, which gives us a performance and a pattern um, that's very elegant. So uh, the next concept with jQuery is the selector. And these are CSS style selectors. There's a link there for the, the documentation of the selectors that jQuery supports, um, which is extremely broad. But what's going on here is I'm going to select all of the list items in the document. And you'll see that the list items here are bold and black and underlined. And those are the elements that I now am able to work with. Um, so we'll. I'll move forward here. And so here's a, another representation. I selected all the list items. And you'll notice that I have uh, array notation there. I have square brackets with three elements that were selected. This is the core concept of a collection. And one of the things that's easy to gloss over when you start getting into jQuery. And you'll see that these three elements are really um, references or handles to the actual DOM nodes. and it. it allows us to work with them in, in your typical array format if you're from a, a traditional programming background, or um, if you don't have a lot of programming from a list. So we basically have a list of elements. And in this case, they're sequential, but they don't necessarily have to be sequential, um, as we'll see going forward. So the next core concept in jQuery is chaining. So you'll see here that I started with selecting all the list items. And then I, dot, I did dot .eq0. And dot .eq0 will take the elements that I've selected and return to me a new collection with just that first element, in this case, a list item. 
So you can see the previous collection of elements, and jQuery actually stores a reference to them internally, and I have them uh, uh, faded out there. And this allows uh, to really start constructing jQuery sentences and uh, be, become effective as a developer. And so coupled with the chaining and the collections, there, there's also the ability to uh, revert back to the previous collection. And that's what dot end does. So in this example here, you'll see that now the, the first collection I had selected is now the primary and active one. So that's really the, the core concepts um, in a very brief overview. Um, but now that we have that as kind of our base, we can dig into kind of the, the mistakes or areas of improvement. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and take a question here. Um, it says, how soon after CSS3 becomes official do you think jQuery will support its selectors? That's actually an excellent question and one that comes up a lot of time because there are, there's some discrepancy in which browsers support CSS3. And there's, there's still some varying um, nature to that in terms of going from IE to Firefox to Safari and WebKit. Um, but specifically jQuery, since it's not dealing with the CSS rendering engine um, for parsing of those CSS selectors, it supports a much greater uh, ex uh, syntax. So pretty close to all of the current CSS3 selectors jQuery already supports natively. And uh, what we're waiting to catch up now is for browsers to implement um, the, the CSS3 selector syntax specifically for their rendering engine. Um, but as far as selecting elements, jQuery already has that capability of expressing that. So uh, again, here's, here's kind of the five topics that we're going to cover. So selector performance. Um, I, I've worked on a, a number, like I said, of large projects. And a lot of times I've, I've come in um, either through uh, a number of iterations of the product or um, it's one of those that's been a legacy. So uh, the, the first thing that really is something to watch out for is extremely verbose cascading style sheet selectors. And yes, I was trying to be verbose there. Um, the one below it is actually one that I pulled out of a project I was working on. And uh, that, was, that was what was being executed. Um, it, it, from, from a, a selector syntax, it was very accurate in mirroring the DOM completely, but at the cost of performance. And additionally, if we made any changes structurally to the layout, so for example, let's say that we added another, um, we removed the div.wrapper. Well, that did a huge uh, maintenance in, in having to go back and modify all of our selectors. So if we look at kind of what a better selector would be, uh, we have dot regions td company anchor tag. And one of the things, if, if you had a chance to go to the jQuery conference in Boston uh, this past year, Paul Irish did a fabulous talk on jQuery anti-patterns and got into some of the selector performance there and how jQuery's internal sizzle CSS uh, actually parses apart those selectors and, and goes about finding them the elements from the DOM. And one of the things is that you want to get more specific with your selector on the right side and less specific on the left side. So um, in, this case, in this case here, doing a dot regions on the left versus, say, a uh, table dot regions is going to perform slightly better. But still, we have a number of elements there in the selector that, that are making it up. So an, alternate, uh, um, an alternative that's better is to start with pound results. So we're going to select an element by ID, and then we're going to go and do a find. And what's going to take place here, um, and I'll, well, I'll get, that, get to that in one moment here as we, we get to the next one. And the next problem that is fairly common is over-selecting IDs. So the DOM API has a very performant um, document.getElementById, and it's, it's fabulous. It works extremely fast. And jQuery in Sizzle.js, uh, the underlying selector engine, make use of this. And in doing that, they take a shortcut to that native DOM method and returns the element very quickly. When you do div pound wrapper, that's actually going to short circuit the uh, performance shortcut that jQuery will take 
and instead um, expand that out into a full f expression and execute it um, in a much longer, uh, slightly slower performance way. And so the best is to do a straight selection by ID. So in this case, we're just selecting pound wrapper. Um, and jumping back up to the, the alternative there, where we have pound results.find, we're first going to select that results ID, and that's going to be very fast. And from there, we're going to do a dot .find. And so at this point, it's only going to search a subset of the DOM as opposed to the entire document. Um, and so this is, this is a great way to uh, improve your selector performance. One thing to keep in mind, uh, kind of as a rule of thumb, is the KISS principle. Um, keep it simple. And the, the thing that's important is, is don't prematurely optimize. Um, because what, what is currently the, the pattern that Sizzle.js uses, that may change down the road. Um, it's not slated to change right now, but there's a potential that it could. And if you're uh, crafting your selectors in such a way that you're coding to a, a current optimization um, and that implementation changes, that could be uh, a performance bottleneck in the, down the road. So as long as you, you stick to kind of general selectors, um, there obviously are going to be those edge cases where you need to go in and, and do some additional work for um, DOMs where, where you have a significant number of elements. So say that you're selecting 500. Um, that's, that's an area where, where you're really looking to um, improve performance. But, but don't get too creative in your selectors. So I'll um, go ahead and take a couple questions here. So the first question is from Aaron. And uh, the question is, is there a performance difference between dot eq and colon eq. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, dot eq is going to be an actual um, jQuery method. So in the previous examples here, I'll jump back. Here we go. Uh, we're selecting all our list elements and doing a dot eq. And an alternate, uh, alternative way that, that you could express that um, would be with the type it into the chat here, um, is to use a pseudo selector, which is part of jQuery's syntax here. So you'll see that I have list item EQ. And so that's actually encapsulated within the query string. Um, dot EQ will probably perform um, slight, well, slightly faster um, than the inline. But the performance is really going to be negligible. Um, a lot of times, either way, um, is, is, is not going to be noticeable. So feel free to use either, either approach. Um, the next question would be, wouldn't table.regions be better than .regions because a class selector is among the slowest selectors in jQuery? In IE, it loops through every DOM, through the entire DOM. And, and that is correct with, um, let me jump back to our uh, previous slide here. That is correct with, with one exception in that case, and that is jQuery actually constructs elements from right to left. And so in this example here, we're going to select all of the anchor tags first. Then it's going to look for the anchor tags that have a, a, a table data cell dot company as a parent and finally dot region. So that last comparison, it only has to look at the class name property versus the tag name also. Um, okay, and we'll, we'll take one more question here uh, regarding selector performance. Um, Tom asked, uh, I, have a, I have understood that this, this style is better. And he's doing dot results um, with a compound. So I'll go ahead. I'll throw that into the chat there. Um, whoops, forgot the dollar sign. Okay, there we go. And this is actually, that, Tom, that's one of the patterns that Paul Irish uh, pulled out in, in his anti-patterns talk. His, his talk is actually up on SlideShare, and we can get the link to that afterwards. But what actually will happen here um, is jQuery will transform that internally into a results.find.results um, here. And so it's, it's best to just use kind of the that syntax that I just typed in there as opposed to passing in an ID in the context setting there. So 
looking at forward here at this point to our next, which is the each itis um, explicit iteration. So this is common as you as you get into jQuery. One of the first things you want to do is start iterating over a set of elements that you've selected um, and work with them. And jQuery provides without each. Uh, method, which you can provide a callback function, which makes it really elegant without having to uh, deal with indexes or uh, really the, the loop construct. But one of the things is, as we look in, in our code example here, um, we're, we're iterating over every list item element here explicitly. So you'll see in the comments, uh, comment one here, explicitly iterating over all list items. So that's the first thing. That, that in itself is not bad. Um, but what we're going to do internally is explicitly iterate over a single element, so we're creating a new jQuery object, and then we're going to explicitly iterate over that element again, additionally creating a new jQuery uh, object again. And really, there, there's a number of situations where the type of, of programming that you're doing within a loop um, really requires that you, you iterate over each element, like, and, and that's okay. But in our particular example here, this can be refactored into um, removing that outer loop. And this is going to implicitly iterate, which means that .css, color blue in this case, the .css method will iterate over each list item and uh, set the CSS color for it. So we're, we're really jumping into a loop construct, in this case, twice. Um, so we've removed one loop. We can move this example forward again, um, and, and here are the comments for, for where the implicit iteration is taking place. This can be further refined into making use of the object literal syntax that CSS encompasses. So in our case here, we've removed that second iteration. And so this is really the, the optimal way. Um, one thing to point out, in this example here, I'm, I'm using the .css method and setting some individual properties. And the, the best approach would be to actually use a uh, CSS class that is defined in a style sheet and then you, to use a .add class or .remove class. That is going to be the, the optimal performing way to modify the style. But for examples of our purposes, the .css is the, uh, it makes for a great case here. So, this is one way, um, again, using .each is not bad in itself, but for examples here, it really makes the most sense to remove that um, as the way that, um, that extra loop. So now we, we're getting into um, the event binding portion. And, and this is, I, I would say this is really kind of a, a meat and potatoes type topic um, in one where uh, I, I hope there's a lot of benefit that comes out of it. So to start, we're going to look at um, the differences between the bind, delegate, and live event. So in our case here, we have a, a section of jQuery code on the left. We're going to select all of the list items, do a dot click, and then bind a callback function. Fairly typical piece of jQuery code. And on the right, you'll see that we have our DOM there. And you'll notice that the list items are highlighted in black and bold. And so when you do a dot click, that's a shortcut for dot bind click. And it's going to bind that single event handler to all three elements. Or it's going to iterate over those three elements, binding the event handler to each one. So that in itself is not, um, not bad. That's, that's a very common pattern. jQuery supports that API. And um, that, that's something that you see. Where, where it differs is, when we start to use the dot delegate. So if you remember back to the beginning, um, we, we looked at how a click event propagates up the DOM. So if you remember that the, the click event originated on the list item, then when all those handlers were finished, it was passed up to the unordered list and to the body and to the document. Well, dot delegate will bind a single event handler, in this case, to the unordered list. So we're selecting the unordered list first. Then we're calling .delegate. And the first argument that you pass into .delegate is a selector. The second argument is the event that you're binding to. And the third argument is your callback function. And so what we've done here is effectively bound a single event listener uh, as opposed to three. And so this is going to give us some uh, performance improvement. 
and we'll, we'll look at the trade-offs between the two there. So any questions at this point um, in, in terms of uh, the difference between .bind and .delegate? Okay. And so jumping into .live, which is very similar to .delegate except with uh, a few differences. So in this case here, instead of passing in the selector as the first argument to .delegate, Live actually uh, expects that to be passed in in your standard jQuery selector location. So in this case, we're starting to uh, by selecting all list items, and then we do dot live click. And what this will do is this will attach a callback function to the document. And at this point, the benefit to using event binding for such as live and dot delegate is that if we modify that document or, or the DOM in any way, since the event handler is bound to the document object itself, um, as those events propagate up, the event handler will intercept them and respond. So that's all to say that we can now modify our document without having to worry about rebinding events, which is very beneficial. So there was a question, uh, do we ever need to use dot .bind? And the short answer is yes. There are still uh, instances and cases where dot .bind is uh, very useful. And in one of the next slides here, we'll, we'll call that out. But the, the main difference is that um, dot .bind will, will bind that event to essentially the closest element on which the event originates. And so that's going to be a bit of a performance increase there. So with Jira 1.4.live supports uh, the context argument, which is that second parameter. So in this code example here, we have the unordered list, and we're going to start by selecting it. So I do dollar sign UL, and I'm using array notation, that's square bracket zero, and that will give me the first element um, in the raw DOM element. So at this point, it's not uh, wrapped in a jQuery object. And I'm going to pass that in to uh, the line below that where I'm selecting all list items. And this in, in this case here, dot .live instead of binding to the document element will actually bind it closer to those list items, in this case the unordered list. And again we're doing the, the dot .click event. So if we move this forward here, what's the main difference um, between uh, the dot .delegate and dot .live. Because you'll notice here they're both using event delegation. So the, the main difference is the order of arguments and then a performance. Because in using dot .live, jQuery, when it's passed that selector initially, will have to execute it to search for elements. And so in this case, it'll, it'll go in, out and search all list items. But the dot .live handler will look at that selector you passed in when events are triggered. So that selector is not actually used at that point until an event is triggered. Not delegate, since that selector is passed in as a first argument, it will not execute it against the DOM when you set up this method. And so it's going to perform um, slightly better than .live. Now, um, I see we're getting a lot of questions about this, and this is excellent. So I'm going to walk through the differences in the event binding here in kind of a comparison, and then we'll go through and address each of these questions. So normal binding using dot .bind, the downsides, it's possibly slower during initialization. And, and I say possibly here because we're working with a, a highly dynamic environment where one web application may have, say, 1,200 DOM elements, and another one may only have 800. And so the level of performance differs greatly. And so it's, it's typically very specific to your um, type of application. But as a general rule of thumb, dot .bind will perform slower upon initialization because it has to select all of those elements. Um, contrasting that with event delegation using dot .delegate, it only has to bind a single event handler, and it doesn't have to execute 
the selectors at buying time, and so you gain a performance improvement there. So the, it really depends on how many elements um, you're selecting and attaching events to. If you have just a handful of elements, one or two, that bind is going to be adequate for you. It'll, it'll perform wonderfully. If you have, say, 50 table rows that you're selecting, dot delegate will work better because it's going to bind a single event handler to, let's say, the table element and won't have to bind 50 of them. Uh, the next thing is dot bind, since you're binding it to a specific element, you'll need to rebind it to any new, or you'll need to bind it to any new elements that you add. So let's say that we're working with a um, unor unordered list, and we have three list items, and we call dot bind on them. Uh, what we'll need to do then is if we add two more list items, we'll have to bind a click event to those also. So there's a little bit of overhead then in managing your events as you modify the DOM. With using .delegate, since it's bound to the unordered list, we can add additional list items and not have to bind any of the events. So that's really an improvement for developers there uh, in, in speed and just less code that we have to write. Now, starting to get into performance, .bind will execute faster. And that's because if we go back, let me see if I can get back here to, um, Okay, so here is where we're dealing with the core concepts of DOM events. So dot .bind will essentially bind that event to our first list item here versus using a dot .live, which will bind it to the document. So you can see that the difference here is that when the user clicks on the list item, that event handler is already attached to that element versus waiting for it to bubble up to the document to where it's handled. So that's a huge benefit here. I'll jump back to the slides for a minute. Um, the, so the, the trade-off then with .delegate is that it's going to be slightly slower because it has to wait for the event to propagate up. So .bind works for high performance events um, at event trigger time. .delegate works for uh, initialization time when you have a lot of elements. Um, one other trade-off is since dot .bind is attached to that specific list item, when that event is triggered, you can actually stop propagation or cancel the event and suppress it from bubbling up. With dot .delegate, since we're listening to it from, say, the document element or the unordered list, it doesn't know that event originated until it was triggered and has bubbled up. So at that point, there really isn't a whole lot you can do with stopping propagation. So um, now let's jump in and um, okay. So the, the first question comes from Stephen, and the the question is: Besides, uh, do not repeat yourself. How much faster is dot delegate versus rolling your own event delegation with doing a target dot is li? Um, Performance-wise, there, there's not a huge um, difference because you're, you're still having to test and compare the element um, that the event originated on. So in that case there, uh, .delegate is really a convenience or utility method that makes it easy. Um, the, the difference being that .delegate will set the value this to be the element on which the event originated versus with using a dot .bind and rolling your own, you have to do some work since this is the reference to the element that you're bound on. Um, I don't have a slide on that, and I'll, I'll see. We'll, we'll post some follow-up examples um, to some of these questions with some actual code. Next question comes um, from Andy. And Andy asks, are there performance considerations for having a ton of .live methods? Well, um, it, with, with jQuery 1.4, there were a number of performance improvements in the eventing model. And so that's not as great a concern as it used to be with, say, jQuery 1.3. Um, I, I would say that there are not a, 
a significant number of concerns. But as I say that, someone always comes up with that edge case of, you know, let's say 500 live events, and they wonder why it doesn't perform. So um, it, it really boils down to a lot of times additionally what you're doing in your callback function. So if you have a click event that's doing a series of AJAX requests and it does a lot of DOM manipulation and that type of thing, that's obviously going to perform a lot slower than, say, a click event that just adds a class. So um, there's a number of factors to take into consideration there. But generally, you can do a, a, a large number of .live events without any significant performance uh, degradation. Um, it, it's .live setting up a number of those events will be a lot more performance upon initialization of the page versus using a .bind and selecting, say, 200 elements. Uh, the next question would be, um, uh, let me see here. Uh, okay. The next question comes from Jeff, and the question is, Jonathan, is there any performance difference between using delegate and live with a context as the second param? And um, Jeff, that's an, that's an excellent question. I'm going to jump back here um, to this particular slide. And, and the performance difference really gets called out in the fact that um, in the first line of code there, where I have dollar sign li, and then I'm passing in the context unordered list, at that point in time, jQuery doesn't know the methods that are going to be executed further down the chain, in this case, dot .li. So jQuery will take that unordered list, and it will go ahead and select all of the list items underneath it. And then dot .live is called and dot .live will then take that selector that was executed, in this case a list item, and cache it for when the event handling or events are triggered and it has that context to compare. So essentially we've done a, a, a selection against the DOM, but in this case, in our example, we're not actually using any of those elements. So if we look at the, the line below that, where we first start with an unordered list and we're calling dot .delegate, jQuery will start off with creating um, a new object with just that unordered list. So we haven't done any DOM selections at this point. Dot delegate, then we pass in that selector to, and it will cache it similar to dot live, but we haven't executed any DOM selections, and so it's going to perform better. So that's the main distinction um, between those two. And really, dot delegate has been a, a huge addition to the, the eventing model within jQuery. Okay, the next question comes from Chris, and it says, what about stranding, uh, stranding events using click? Do you, remember, do you recommend always explicitly unbinding? And jQuery is, is great in garbage collecting for you. Um, event handlers floating around used to be a very prolific um, issue that developers had to manage themselves. And jQuery does that for you um, a lot of times. On page unload, jQuery will go through and unbind any uh, floating event handlers, if you would, and, and cleans it up, particularly for browsers like Internet Explorer that have a tendency to leak memory sometimes. And so generally, as you, you don't have to worry about unbinding. Um, if you do a dot .remove on an element, jQuery, in removing that element from the DOM, will unbind all the event handlers for you. So that's one of the differences. Uh, jQuery 1.4 also introduced a dot detach. And so dot detach does the same thing as dot remove. It removes it from the DOM, but it doesn't unbind any event handlers. And so um, it also stores a reference to the element that was removed so you can then uh, do something with it and move it back inside. But generally, the, the unbinding phase is not something you have to worry about. Um, most of the cases in my development when I'm unbinding events are when I'm uh, disabling features. So for example, say that you have a menu item that's disabled. I'll unbind the click event. Um, and that would be a, a case where unbind would be useful. Um, OK. Let me see. Some of these questions here are you've already answered. Um, OK. The, the next question uh, is from Magenta. And they ask, any best guess as to how much slower event execution will be using delegate. 
are we talking 15 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds? And the, the answer is it really depends. Um, and, and what it depends on is how much DOM exists between the element at which the event originated at and the element at which the event handler is bound. So in most cases, it's probably a 15 millisecond uh, magnitude versus 150. But um, if you have uh, a number of levels of hierarchy down, that can get up there into the 100 millisecond level. Um, and so it, it, I, I would really recommend uh, performing some, some performance testing. Um, and a lot of times that's just clicking through things and seeing how fast it responds. Um, QA has a wonderful ability to judge that, typically in most environments. Um, but I, I would say really go after using .delegate and, and then optimize using .bind where necessary. Um, Next question is from Aaron, and he had, his question was regarding the issue of .delegate and propagation. You can still do event.prevent default, and that is correct. Um, but what's taking place at that point is .delegate is only going to prevent the propagation further up the DOM. So in our list uh, item example, let me jump back to that. If the event originates at the list item, and our event handler is bound at the unordered list, when we call dot stop propagation or prevent default, for example, that will, um, I'm sorry, you were correct. It will still prevent default. I was mixing prevent default with stop propagation. Um, but yes, that will, that will correctly prevent the default firing. So in the case of an anchor tag, it will prevent the browser from visiting that URL. Um, So the, the next question um, is regarding is it better to use dot .live or to manually add event handlers to elements as soon as we add those to the DOM? And it, the, it really, again, boils down, as you've probably noticed, with jQuery there are a number of different ways that you can approach a problem. And there's nothing wrong with binding events right before you insert them into the DOM. But it really always has to deal with the size and magnitude of the, the type of DOM that you're creating. So for example, if you're adding, say, 200 table rows to a table, those, that's, a, that's a good size in terms of uh, HTML elements that you're working with or DOM elements. And therefore, it's going to be more expensive versus saying adding 20 table rows. And so it, it really is a trade-off for what you need to accomplish in each particular situation. Um, okay. So at this point, we'll, um, I'm going to hold off on any additional event questions, and we'll, we'll circle back at the end, and depending on how much time we have, uh, we can go through and, and discuss that further. Um, but the, the main thing to look at in event binding here is really the, these two highlighted points. And for dot bind, it's possibly slower during initialization of the, the handlers versus delegate, which is going to be faster initialization when you have a large number of elements. So our next pattern, we're going to look at handling AJAX errors. And um, really, as you, as you understand the AJAX errors, they really can be broken down into two different types. And that's first network and transport errors. So for example, uh, your, your DSL router goes down and you have no internet connection, um, or the server stops responding, or you get a 500 error, for example. The other type of, of errors are really kind of application level errors, and that has to deal with uh, input validation, um, users unauthenticated, et cetera. And for the most part, the application level errors are handled very well. Um, that's one of the things that you check response coming back from the server. You know, my input's valid. I can proceed. Uh, network and transport are really not uh, handled in most cases, and, as we, and that's what we want to look at today. So in this example, we're using the, the jQuery.get, $.get, which is a shortcut to the $.ajax. And this function, or this method is really beneficial because you provide a URL, a callback function for success, and the data type. And this is typically how AJAX requests are carried out in large products or projects. The one thing 
that this this pattern doesn't really allow for is attaching error handling. So in the case of that URL is unavailable, uh, we have no simple way to capture that. And so for this pattern, the best approach is really to set up a global error handler. So in this case here, um, this is a, a fairly simple example of what's going to happen when the error is triggered, but at least we're catching it. So in this case here, we're binding uh, a dot AJAX error, which is going to actually bind an event handler. And the AJAX uh, within jQuery will export a series of events that get triggered as AJAX requests go throughout. So in this case, we're going to bind an AJAX error event handler to the body. And in this case, we'll pass a series of, of arguments in the callback function. In this case, we're just going to alert AJAX error, and XHR is our, XH, our XML HTTP request object with the dot status being set to the response code of the server. Um, and then we're going to output the URL that was passed in. Uh, so that third argument is the option. So options.url. So in this case, now if our $.get uh, request to the matrix fails, we'll at least handle the network level errors um, that previously were not handled. Okay, and our, our final topic here is um, one that's fairly common um, as, as I've personally stepped into projects here and there and from some very large organiza organizations, and that's with um, specifically sourcing jQuery from public CDNs. So it's wonderful that Google and Microsoft and, and even jQuery via Media Temple um, has CDNs available but it's important to understand the trade-offs in using those. So our first question is, why would you use a CDN? And the, the short answer is servers are typically very fast, highly distributed, and optimized and close to the end users. So it's performance. It's speed and performance. Um, additionally, there's a higher rate uh, if you link to, say, Google's copy of jQuery that that will already exist in the user's browser cache um, since that will uh, be utilized by any sites that have linked to that, as opposed to if you have two separate sites, each using their own version of jQuery, they, uh, jQuery will have to get downloaded twice. So there's, there's a higher rate of hitting the browser's cache. Um, additionally, then there's uh, the bandwidth from the CDN. And I pulled stats last night um, from jQuery CDN, which is co.jQuery.com. And in the month of June, uh, 12 terabytes were transferred. So that's a significant volume of traffic. Um, and so again, a reason why you would use a CDN. So uh, one question here is, can you use a CDN over HTTPS? And the short answer is yes, um, but the CDN has to support it. And um, you just have to match the protocol. One thing that's really slick in dealing with HTTP versus HTTPS uh, in linking to CDN is let's say that your site is on HTTPS uh, example.com. And I'll type this into the chat here, and we'll get the, the code example for uh, later. But uh, what you can actually do is um, instead you can leave the protocol portion off. Um, so let's say that we're going to link to Google's jQuery. And this is a fictitious URL, but we'll, we'll go with it. So if you do that in linking, and in this case I'm leaving off the HTTP colon, the browser will match the request to uh, Google's copy of jQuery.js with whatever protocol the browser is currently in, so HTTP or HTTPS. And so that's a great way without having to sniff out um, the current protocol in use uh, and just let the browser match that. So the next question, uh, really, there, there's a lot of benefits to using the public CDNs, but what are the risks? And the first one is that you're putting your trust in the CDN provider to be available. And oftentimes that sounds ridiculous, uh, talking about Google CDN or Microsoft or even jQuery's, which is on Edgecast, as they have very high uptime. But at the same time, they do go down from time to time, maybe not in a global sense, um, because they're distributed, but you can't have sporadic outages. Um, about two months ago, 
uh, the EdgeCast CDN uh, over in Europe, for some users, uh, stopped responding for about five minutes. And so that was, that was, there was an outage and there, there wasn't much that we could do and it, it came back online, but there was still an outage. Um, one of the things with, with approaching a CDN is that effectively in using a public CDN, you have no service level agreement or support contract. So if it goes down, who are you going to call? Um, there, there's really not much recourse there that you can do. And so additionally, if there's a, a CDN issue, um, your, your site may load correctly, but if you're dependent upon jQuery loading from the CDN, it will fail to load and then your, scripe, your uh, site will most likely throw some script errors. So it's, it's important to understand this. And uh, for you know my personal websites and, and stuff like that, I, I link to Google's uh, public version because honestly, if, if my site goes down for a couple minutes here and there, that's not a big deal. But um, a lot of clients we talk into or work with, and they're they're using the Google version, and they've linked their business to Google CDN effectively. So here's a, a, a rough diagram to kind of help us outline um, the, the three different factors that we look at as whether a private CDN or a public CDN is of use. So on the left here, we have uh, business critical. And if you're running a very business critical site with a high uh, importance to the success, um, I would really say that you're better off looking at a private CDN um, versus using the public. Um, same thing with traffic. So in the, the bottom gray areas, that's really the optimal use of public CDN. So you have a not entirely business critical site, um, but you have a high volume of traffic. Great use of a public CDN. You're saving a lot of bandwidth costs there. Um, additionally, if you have uh, for your infrastructure kind of a very low budget and you're tight, um, it, CDNs can get expensive, and so why not use a free one? Um, so that's another a, a great use case. But if you have a business per se um, in, in let's say the e-commerce uh, space, and you are getting thousands of visitors uh, per hour and per second and minute, and so a lot of high traffic, and it's it's critical that transactions go through. You really want to make sure that you're hosting jQuery on your existing infrastructure. Because um, when you set up a CDN account and you have an SLA and something goes wrong, you have a phone number that you can call. Um, and again, if, if you're using Google's version, um, there's not much recourse of action there. So this is, is one of the most important things that I, I think a lot of people have overlooked. Um, I've talked with a number of individuals that say that they've convinced their boss to use the, the Google version of, of jQuery. And that's excellent, but you just need to understand that that can have an impact on your business. So the, the final topic here uh, kind of covering CDNs is sourcing jQuery from hot linking. Um, jQuery and jQuery UI are currently heavily hot linked um, from non-CDNs. So for example, jQuery has a number of servers that, that run our infrastructure um, running Apache and, Apache and Nginx, et cetera. And dev.jQuery.com is not set up to be a CDN, a CDN type uh, service or uh, architecture. And a number of sites are linking directly to the version of jQuery on that. Um, so here's the warning. Do not do it. Uh, quarter three of this year, hot linking will be disabled. And if you're currently linked against, uh, for example, dev.jQuery.com, that will uh, break your site. Um, and it is a numerous list of sites uh, that are hot linking, including number of .gov sites, and I will spare you as to which one specifically, but um, just be aware that that's something that's coming down the pipeline. So if you're going to look for a, a free hosted version of jQuery, um, go ahead and, and on the documentation there, docs.jquery.com slash downloading jQuery, all the CDN information is there. So go feel free to use jQuery's or Google's or Microsoft's or some of the others that we have there. Um, and one question I had here is, not sure what you mean by hot linking. Um, and that's, that's an excellent question actually. And, and what it means is, let's say that I'm running uh, a site example.com 
and I throw a script tag on there, and I'm going to pull in uh, a version of jQuery, but I'm going to link directly to dev.jQuery.com. Um, and actually, when the browser will load that in, they'll pull in the script, uh, the content from your site, and then it will pull in jQuery from the uh, jQuery's dev server. And so you're actually placing your dependency upon jQuery's dev server staying up. So that, that's really the term hot linking. Um, and so the, the best approach, the, the only difference between hot linking to dev.jQuery.com and uh, code.jQuery.com is that code.jQuery.com is a CDN and dev.jQuery.com is just an Apache server. So we'll go ahead and at this point um, go through and, and start answering some of these questions. Um, the, uh, Alberto asks, what C which CDN is the most popular, uh, i.e., which one is the most likely to, to already be in the user's cache? Um, and you know what? That's, that's a great question. Um, and I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, we don't have specific stats for Google and Microsoft CDN. Um, one of our sponsors, Pingdom, did a blog post um, a while back testing the performance of the various CDNs. Um, and that, that's a great read. We'll get that link out to you. Um, but at, at this point, I would say uh, pick one. So pick Google, for example. Um, and, and even if there's a cache miss, so the user doesn't already have jQuery in their browser, Google will, will respond fairly quickly. Um, as well, but again, take a look at that Pingdom blog post, um, which gets into some more specific performance details. Um, Alberto also had a question, what's an example of a private CDN? Um, so there are a number of ones out there. Um, Amazon has one, for example. Um, there's a number of, of larger production level ones, such as Edgecast. Um, so if you Google for Content Delivery Network, or CDN, you'll get a, a whole slew of providers that are available. Um, so Dave has a question. If your site is broken when scripts don't load or are blocked, isn't that a bigger problem? Well, that is a big problem. That's a, that's a huge problem. Um, and that, the particular cause of a site being broken when scripts don't load um, is what we're specifically talking about here in that a CDN fails to respond. And so we want to make sure that, um, that we, we know and we understand uh, where we're loading jQuery from. Uh, Daniel has a question, how do we find a list of available CDNs? Um, and on the slide here uh, for hot linking, actually the second bullet point, right there, there's a link to docs.jQuery.com slash downloading jQuery. And on that, um, the URL is a bit misleading because it says downloading jQuery. Um, so that's where you can pull down the source, but also where you can link to the CDNs, et cetera. Um, so at this point, um, close to wraps up. Um, I'm on Twitter as JD Sharp, and we'll hang around here for a couple more minutes and answer any additional questions um, that may pop up. But thank you for coming, and we'll follow up with some links uh, and get those sent out to resources that we talked about and such. And thanks again. Hey, Jonathan, Catherine here. I just want to thank you for yes. an excellent presentation. Uh, that was incredible, and you did a great job answering the, all the questions, too. Thank you so much for doing this. And Wonderful. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. It's been right. a lot of fun. Great. I hope we can have you back sometime. And <laughs> Absolutely. Great. And I also want to thank everyone in the audience today because we had such an incredible group with us that um, there was so much information shared there that always adds so much. So thank you, everyone. And um, I did, do want to say, in case you didn't hear about the recording, we'll have it available in a couple of days. And I'll s it takes us a while to process them. And I'll send the link to everyone who registered. You can also find, uh, you'll be able to find, if you haven't registered, you'll be able to find the uh, embedded version of it on our webcast page. That's O'Reilly.com slash webcast. And, um, or on our YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com uh, slash O'Reilly Media. And you can find all of our webcasts there, most of them, 98%. Uh, there's also a, a 
survey would like for you to take if you have a chance to just give us some feedback on how we did and help us improve this uh, experience, if we can do that for you. And I'm pasting the link in the chat room right now, if it'll work for me. It doesn't seem to be working. Um, I don't know. Oh, let me just uh, say this. Let me try now. Um, there we go. You'll also get an email from us in about 12 hours with a link to the survey if you don't get a chance to take it here. And we choose from the survey takers, randomly choose three people to get a free ebook of your choice. So that should be some incentive. And yes, we'll have the slides available. I don't have them available now, but if you want a copy of them, you can shoot an email to webcast at O'Reilly.com and we'll give it to you. And don't forget our um, book discount. Sorry, all this information. It's forecast, the numeral 4, C-A-S-T. It will give you 40% um, off books, 50% off ebooks from O'Reilly.com. Um, not good on O'Reilly UK or Safari Books Online, but you can use it with any books that we sell on our site. And we do distribute other publishers like Pragmatic and SitePoint. So we have some good selections there. And I think that's about it. And but Jonathan, I am really looking forward to seeing you at OSCON. I hear your uh, your session is sold out. Your tutorial, right? Yes, that is that is correct. We uh, will be in OSCON next week, um, and so if you're there in the Portland area, be sure to stop by. We'd love to talk to you. You can hit me up on Twitter um, and track us down that way. Okay, great. So I'm going to close the. I'll leave the chat room open for a couple more minutes if people want to um, exchange notes or anything, and then I'll, I'll say goodbye, everyone, and close it out. But Jonathan, one more time, thank you so much for the great presentation today. Thanks again. And Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.